All right. Welcome to round two of live coding with me, Jason Rodriguez from Litmus. I, I few of you have probably were probably here last time, last month we did live coding, where I went through and built a receipt email from scratch using Litmus Builder, a little HTML, a little CSS, and uh, you know some fast fingers uh, flying through that code pretty quickly. Uh, so I thought for this month's live stream, I would revisit that email, which I haven't really looked at since last month, since that initial coding session, and figure out how we can make it in certain email clients. Uh, because I know from, you know, we, we did a quick preview of that email in different email clients last month. Um, so I, I know things like Microsoft Outlook, there were a couple of issues. I think there was like a a font not rendering issue, some padding issues, and I'm sure there's some other things that probably need to be fixed in mobile clients, or at least optimized for mobile clients to make the email useful on mobile. Uh, so I think that uh, today's live stream would be revisiting that receipt email, uh, going through, seeing breaking where, making a list of things to troubleshoot, and then actually trouble troubleshooting those problems. Um, so walk you through my process for trying out different solutions, where to look, what resources to use for figuring out problems to those solutions, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so this month on the live stream for Litmus' YouTube channel, uh, which you should obviously all subscribe to if you haven't already, we're going to be troubleshooting that receipt email. Um, so again, I'm Jason Rodriguez. You've probably seen me on different webinars, uh, the Litmus blog at Limus Live or the Email Design Conference back in the day, uh, among other places. Uh, I am the community and product evangelist. I spend my time teaching people how to make better emails and send better email marketing campaigns. Um, and I kind of come from a development and design background, but it's definitely not something I do on a daily basis. Uh, so these live streams are fun for me to uh, kind of dust off my coding skills. Um, but I will say that this isn't my daily job is coding emails anymore. Um, so you'll probably see me struggle a couple of times, but I think that's kind of par for the course for email marketing and design in general because there are so many different challenges. Uh, so thanks for everybody for joining. Uh, feel free to use the chat in the live stream on YouTube there. I am keeping an eye on it when I'm looking over here. That's what I'm doing. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any for troubleshooting or fixing some of the issues that will probably be seeing in the email. I would love to hear about them in the chat. Um, and if you have any resources or anything like that to share with everybody else here, uh, feel free to post those there as well. A couple that I kind of use as my go-to resources when I'm looking at email code and rendering issues, uh, but I'm sure there's other ones out there that, that you all use that I would love to hear about as well. Um, so with that being said, let's uh, get over into the email and see what we're looking at here. Um, so you should see Chrome is open for me right now. Uh, I am inside of Litmus. I am inside of Builder specifically, which is our dedicated code editor for email designers, developers, marketers. Uh, there's a bunch of cool features that make designing emails a lot easier for folks. Um, but we, we have this email that we worked on in last month's live stream on YouTube. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. There's not too much going on. It's your typical kind of transactional receipt email. Um, so imagine a, a customer just purchased something online. In our case, we made up this company called Blobby Blobs. They sell blobs of all sizes because um, I love that kind of like blob graphic design element. Uh, so somebody bought one large blob and two small blobs for that amount of money. Uh, they spent $83.57 on blobs, which, depending on who you ask, might be really expensive for blobs, but who knows. Uh, but pretty pretty straightforward. We have our table here of the actual order information. Uh, we have a nice little button here for contacting customer support if you need help with your order. Um, the footer down here with the logo and some kind of default uh, information about Blobby Blobs, uh, all that good stuff that you typically see in a transactional email. Um, so running through the code, you want to kind of do a little bit of a refresher here for you as well as me, because again, I haven't looked at this code in about a month, a um, little over a month, because we're doing this live stream a week late. Uh, we're typically going to be doing the 
live coding or some sort of practical live stream session on the second Friday of every month. Uh, but we had, I had a webinar with marketing profs last week, so I was pushed a week here. Um, it was part of their Friday forums, which was super fun. Uh, if you didn't already, feel free to check that out at marketingprofs.com. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to be doing this second Tuesday of every month is going to be a practical session, usually live coding, um, or design or something like that. And then the last Friday of every month is live optimization, where we look at people's real email campaigns and try to provide some constructive criticism, some feedback to improve them. That'll be happening the last Friday of this month as well. I still have to reach out to some folks and see if they want to help out and jump on and you know, critique some emails. If you know of anybody that might be interested, let me know. I'd love to hear from them. Um, but yeah, I haven't looked at this code in in about a month. Uh, I do kind of know the overall structure because I built it, and it's using this kind of boilerplate that I typically use, uh, which is largely based on a template from Mark Russ, who releases a bunch of stuff at goodemailcode.com, um, which is his arrogantly named library of good email code, as you can tell. Uh, but a really great resource for getting just some kind of default stuff uh, going for your either doing specific things and something I definitely rely on because Mark is much smarter than I am as an email developer. Uh, so I definitely trust his code and his commitment to creating accessible emails and responsive email, making sure all the code's looking good. Um, but my version, my kind of boilerplate, I commented out a couple of things just as a reminder myself or anybody using them, what these different snippets of code do. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward. It's using this kind of fluid by default or this hybrid coding approach. Um, so I have this kind of container table here, or this container div rather. It's not really using any tables outside of Microsoft ghost tables that only Outlook will be seeing. Um, but I have this container div that the max width set to 600 pixels. Uh, so the content will never be greater than 600 pixels. Uh, Microsoft Outlook does not honor that code place on divs, which is why we have this conditional Microsoft table here. Um, so you can see we're targeting Microsoft with this conditional comment saying if this is greater than or equal to MSO9, which is a specific version of Microsoft Office, which is why a lot of versions of Outlook use to render our HTML, or if it's IE Internet Explorer as like a rendering engine, then use this table to wrap that entire email campaign, um, or all the content inside of it, rather. Um, so here's where we have our width set to 600 uh, pixels. We don't need to use PX there because the width attribute kind of implies that's in, that it's in pixels by default. Um, just wrapping that stuff to make it work a little bit better in Outlook. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. We have some semantic markup in here to try to keep things accessible. Uh, we have this paragraph tag that is our bit of copy up top here. Uh, we have a text link in there for checking the status of your order. Uh, we do use a table down below for the receipt information, the actual order information. Since that is tabular data, that's what tables are there to display and mark up in our content. Um, so we did use that as it was intended to be used. Uh, so you can see on the table here, we're not declaring role equals presentation. We're not trying to take that out of the accessibility model. Uh, we want this to be read out as a table because that's exactly what it is. Um, but for accessibility purposes, for our presentational stuff, our kind of layout tables uh, for Outlook here, we do put in that attribute role equals presentation to keep that accessible, especially for people using screen readers. Um, other than that, though, you know, it's a paragraph down below for... Uh, again, this bit of copy, we have this centered button down here using the deprecated but still very functional center tag in HTML. And then we have our anchor tag and a couple of styles applied to that to make this nice big blue button. Oh, we have some rounded corners, looks nice and sleek, and then we have the footer down here. Uh, so again, nothing really fancy. Um, we close out that ghost table down here because you want to make sure you close out all of your elements. Uh, but if we, so so this is just like the browser view of that email campaign uh, that Litmus is displaying, that Builder is displaying right here. Um, you can see that by default, uh, everything kind of shrinks down because we are using that max width kind of rule uh, for 
declaring the, the widths of our container of that div. Um, so it will naturally be 100% wide up to 600 pixels wide, and then it'll stop growing um, and just kind of center in the in the display here. Um, so in the browser version, it looks good, it renders well, um, but I'm using Chrome here, which has an excellent rendering image in engine for HTML and CSS. Um, so I wanna look at it in actual email clients and see how that email is displaying because that's where you're gonna run into issues is when you actually send a campaign like this to your subscribers, they open it up in their email client of choice and that's what they're gonna, not what we see in the browser necessarily. Um, so the first step in troubleshooting any email is going to be looking at it in all of these different email clients to see what issues are actually cropping up. Um, so Litmus obviously makes that super easy. We have, I think it's around 100 different email clients that we allow you to preview your emails in. Everything from Lotus, which hopefully you don't have to worry about, but some clients still use that, uh, especially at kind of the corporate level. We have all the old versions of Outlook, newer versions of Outlook, um, a whole bunch of mobile email clients and devices, all your webmail clients here. Um, all that good stuff that allows you to really quickly select which clients you want to see your email in and then preview in those real clients. We're using real email clients and taking screenshots of those. Um, so this is essentially typically like exactly what your, your subscribers are going to be. Um, so when we look at these, this is what a subscriber might see when they look at this email in Apple Mail 13 uh, on Mac OS X. Um, see that it renders really, really well, but that's because Apple Mail uses Wit, which is the same rendering engine that Chrome uses um, for all intents and purposes. I think they call it something different at this point, but uh, it's really, really good, solid rendering engine. So we know that all of our HTML and CSS will look good and the email will render as intended. Um, you can see here we, we do offer dark mode at Lemis for a whole bunch of different email clients. Uh, but right now we're not really doing anything special in our code to make this work well in dark mode. Um, but if we have time today or this month during our live stream, we'll, we'll go through how to actually make this email look really, really good in dark mode and do some custom stuff uh, to swap out these styles and make it look awesome uh, for dark mode users. But right now we're just focusing on troubleshooting stuff. Um, but I'm just going to go through some of the major email clients that I would typically test in. Uh, which email clients you test in is going to be dependent on your audience. Um, so that's where using something like Litmus Email Analytics comes into play. So you can see exactly which clients and rendering engines your subs are opening in. And then kind of tailor your development, your coding, and uh, fixing those bugs for those specific clients instead of everybody. Because you're never going to get an email that looks pixel perfect across you know, 100 different email clients. That's a fool's errand that you're going on there. Um, so I'm just going to flip through some of these. Again, we have another version of Apple Mail Dark Mode. Um, Outlook 2016 on Mac, it looks awesome because, again, this is using WebKit as its rendering engine. It's essentially kind of, it's almost like a wrapper around Apple Mail, um, or at least the rendering engine just made by Microsoft. Uh, so we know things are going to look really good in there. Our rounded borders work. All the space looks good. Um, Outlook 2016 on Windows 10 looks pretty good, except for the fact that we have two major issues here. One is the spacing between these different elements. You can see we lose some of this vertical spacing between these elements so that the email looks kind of squashed and cramped together. Um, and then the major one is with this tape. All right, I had a quick issue with my streaming software. Um, hopefully everybody can see and hear me again. Give me a thumbs up in the chat if you'd be so kind to let me know that you can hear me again. Uh, hopefully it doesn't cut out again. Cool. Uh, so somebody did comment they can hear. Awesome. So it looks like the stream's working again. Um, so yeah, we, we have some issues in Outlook here. Uh, the background color, 
the typeface and the spacing issues. So I already I'm gonna write down that that's those are like things I need to fix. Um, so I guess the first thing I do after looking through some of these email clients is physically like write down the issues that I'm seeing. Uh, so I know I have a checklist to to address and actually go through, and I can just one by one fix each of those issues. Um, if we go further on in different outlooks here, again, similar issues in 2019 on Windows 10. Uh, some spacing issues, uh, this band color, the, the overall table styling isn't there. Um, outlook for Office 365, similar stuff going on. Um, oddly enough, dark mode for Outlook Office 365 looks really, really good. Uh, it's doing its own color switching, which it kind of does for you. You don't have much control over it. But all, all the overall styles are working really well, which is uh, kind of cool to see. Uh, this could be inspiration for the future dark mode version that we custom code. Um, a couple of things I would probably change are the overall colors of the elements here um, and maybe fix this little logo down here so it doesn't just look like the plus sign. You can see the actual outline blobs as well. Um, but we'll go go over that later time or in next, uh, the next live stream. Uh, another version of 365 dark, similar issues. The typeface is weird. The background color for the table is missing, and then those padding issues. Uh, when we get into mobile, things for the most part are looking pretty good, um, with the exception of there. there's probably some optimizations that I want to do to mine here, particularly around the padding for these table cells uh, so that it doesn't look so cramped in the table for your order. Um, and then maybe making this type itself, that, that font, a little bit smaller so that everything's not smushed together. Um, and similar down here, may, maybe making the disclaimer copy a little bit smaller here so that it, it just fits in that space a little bit more nicely. Um, but the paragraph copy looks good. The button looks nice and tappable on mobile. No major complaints there. Um, this is going to be kind of the theme for most mobile clients. Um, Again, maybe just space this stuff out a little bit more, but overall, the, b the bones are there for uh, the email when it comes to mobile rendering. iPad looks awesome. Uh, again, Apple products, their email products are stellar, so you don't usually have to worry too much about uh, rendering issues there. Um, on iPhone 11 Pro, it, it looks a little bit cramped, so again, when we update those styles for Gmail, we'll just apply that across the board for most mobile clients um, to make sure that it works well across all those as well. Uh, if we get on the webmails, everything seems to be looking really good. Uh, so really not too much to worry about there. Gmail, everything's rendering properly. It looks good. The button's down there. That's awesome. Uh, I think the only one I saw was Outlook.com. Wasn't displaying the, the images for whatever reason, uh, which could very easily just be like a capture issue on our end. Like they didn't download in time. Uh, for the screen capture to actually take a picture of those images. Too worried about that. Um, you know, if, if we see that as like a persistent problem, we could address it. But for the most part, what I, I'm going to focus on, the, the issues that really cropped up to me were in Outlook clients. So if we could look at, th this seems to be the worst one, Outlook 2016. On Windows. It's on Windows 10. We have those padding issues. We have the font looking a little bit funky, like it's defaulting back to Times New Roman. Um, and we have this background color, so that's what we want to address. Um, and hopefully by addressing that, it will kind of inherit down to these other Outlook clients uh, because largely using the same rendering in engine, uh, which is Internet Explorer, um, or sorry, Microsoft Word, their rendering engine as opposed to a legit like web browser <laughs> rendering engine like Internet Explorer or WebKit um, or Gecko uh, if you're talking about Firefox. Uh, so that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to address all that stuff and hopefully not break anything in all these other email clients. Um, so how I would typically do this is first kind of look at, I, I mark down the issues that I want to address. So there's Facing that I want to add to these this these different elements, um, so add some padding between the logo and this paragraph, um, this text up here, and the table of the order information, um, the little bit of copy here, and the button, 
uh, and just make it a lot more readable and nicer to use like our kind of default baseline well-designed version. Um, beyond that, I want to make sure I, at the very minimum I have the background color or a border around this table of ordination so that it's kind of set up the rest of the content uh, and then fix this uh, Times New Roman default font because that that doesn't look good to anybody except lawyers and uh, we're not really <laughs> designing for them today. Um, I'm not too worried about you can see that the rounded corners on the button are missing. Uh, that's because I'm using the border radius CSS property on this link uh, which doesn't work in Microsoft Word uh, doesn't support that. There's different ways to add rounded borders using VML, which is vector markup language, uh, which is a proprietary markup language for Microsoft Outlook, uh, Microsoft Office, and so we could add in some VML code to make those buttons rounded or the table corners rounded, like in our default sign. But honestly, that's one of those things I am not worried about at all. Uh, it's it's a minor issue. It doesn't really impact the functionality of the email. Um, so if I can keep my code a little bit more lean without using VML, then I'm probably going <laughs> to default towards doing that. Unless you have a huge percent look users and, you know, you have your boss breathing down your neck to stay on brand or, you know, follow the design system to a T, uh, then you might want to implement one of those issues. Um, but for today, it's, it's going to be the padding stuff. It's going to be the typeface and uh, some sort of like background color or border around uh, those that table there of that information in the email. Um, so really, I, I'm just going to go through my code here and figure out what I need to adjust, how to fix it, uh, and then make those adjustments. So the first thing on my list is going to be that space between these elements. Um, so the way I cut those up, if we go down to them here, we have... This image, which is our logo, it's using, again, that center tag, uh, which is deprecated but still works across email clients and web browsers and is a handy little tool. Um, so you don't have to worry about, you know, display block on your images and using margins or text line or anything like that for certain elements. Uh, just quick and easy, use center on the image. Um, so right now you can see we have, we have this paragraph of copy. Uh, which is this element here that starts with hi Jason and then NV, here's your copy of your receipt for your own records. Um, but that's just smushing up against the image despite us having this 40 pixels of margin on the bottom of it. Um, so we could try one, one hack that I've heard of for like Outlook is to use like margin doesn't work unless you use a capital M for margin. Um, so we could very easily do that and see if that helps out. Uh, see if there's some extra thing there. Just wait for it to gather that. Doesn't look like anything changed. Um, so that might not be the best solution. I am going to add some maybe extra padding uh, or extra margin on the top too, just so it's maybe a little bit more visible. Oops. Um, save that again. I don't think anything major is going to happen, but let's see. Um, so that actually does work, which is nice. So it looks like there was already a piece between there. So that might be the best way to do it. We want to make sure that that doesn't affect the rest of our email clients. So that still looks good. There's a little bit more space between that image and the paragraph. Um, that's going to filter kind of through to all of these. Uh, so it looks like we do actually have a good kind of quick and easy fix for that. If we go back to, um, we're looking at 2016 and Windows 10, uh, we can see that we have, again, some similar issues on this paragraph down here. So I'm going to go find that paragraph, which again is right here, and set that um, to the top, to uppercase margin. I am gonna add a little bit more kind of margin around the paragraph to make it a little bit more visible. Let's see if that works. Sometimes a lot of troubleshooting is just kind of waiting around. So that looks pretty good. Um, it feels like the, one of my issues here is that it feels like the line height 
And this copy is, it's noticeably shorter than our default design. Um, so that's definitely something I want to address. And it, so when we originally set that up, we have this container div of all of our content that sets our like baseline styles for everything. Um, so we have the color set to black. We have the font family set to sans serif. So that'll just use whatever the default uh, sans serif is on that person's system. The font size is set to 18 pixels. Font weight is set to normal. The line height here is set to 1.8. And then we have margin, uh, some default margins, kind of one rem set um, on the top and bottom, give it a little breathing room, and then just kind of center that content in the viewport. Again, max width set to 600 pixels, and then a little bit of padding too, so that when we view this on um, you know, the browser version of our email, it doesn't uh, bump right up against the edges of the content. There's a little bit of space, so it feels a little bit more natural and easy to read. Uh, but when we go into that Outlook 2016, it doesn't seem to be picking up on these default uh, settings. So none of this stuff seems to be applying. I think that's where the text issue is coming into place too. Um, so that's why that table's using what appears to be Times New Roman again. Uh, so a couple of things I could do. One, I could see whether I should kind of be using divs to set that default, uh, those styles, or if maybe I should apply that to a table element or apply those things to the individual paragraphs themselves. Um, just figure out what the best element is to address that issue in Outlook 2016. Uh, so one of my tools for troubleshooting is this website called caniemail.com. Um, so this was put together by, uh, I believe it was Remy Parmentier, who is an email designer from France. Uh, he goes by HTMLU, um, kind of spelled out using, uh, you know, the what appeared to be the Greek spellings or maybe... Uh, a French way of spelling that, I'm not sure. Uh, it's super smart, though. I, I kind of think of him as the ultimate detective, kind of the Sherlock Holmes of email development because he's really good at tracking down issues and fixing them. Um, but essentially what you do with this caniemail.com is go in and just type in whatever you want to check, whether or not it's supported across clients. Um, so I could search for a div. And then it shows me the support for that across all these different email clients. Um, so you can see that div elements have excellent support uh, across almost all email clients. So based on emailclientmarketshare.com, which is something that Lemus actually runs, which will show you, um, you know, the top 10 email clients in use right now based on our email analytics data that's anonymized. Uh, we are working on updating this and making it a little bit more useful for folks, but that'll happen later this year. Uh, but 92.73% of email clients do support um, using div, which is cool. Um, so maybe that's not the issue. Uh, it, setting those things there isn't really the issue. Um, but I do want to test something and see if I apply these default styles to this table uh, that is specific to Outlook, if, if that works out for us. Um, so I'm going to go up to the ta ghost table here. Um, add those inline styles and save it. And I'm just curious, again, I haven't like had to troubleshoot an email like this in Outlook in a really long time. So I'm kind of just, you know, seeing what happens if, if it helps out. Um, in this case, it doesn't look like it is. So now I know that's, that's not really going to help us out there. So I, uh, for the sake of keeping our code lean attainable, I'm going to get rid of that. Um, resave it, just get back to our default state. That'll rerun the test there. Uh, so the next thing I, I think I want to try is seeing if I apply line height to different elements that I think aren't inheriting that value, uh, if that'll work out. Um, so I can go to my paragraph element here where all that copy is and just add in the line height of 1.8 and save that and see if that kind of gives us a little bit more breathing room on those lines there. Um, so that doesn't be, seem to be working either. That's not gonna help out. Um, so I'm gonna get rid of that. Not gonna worry about it. Um, one thing that comes to mind too, as I'm kind of working through my thought process how to fix this, is if 
this this kind of 1.8 is a there's no unit on this it's not like set to pixels or percent or anything like that which for line height at least makes it a kind of relative unit i wonder if outlook doesn't understand that unit um so maybe instead of saying 1.8 that relative unit i can actually set this to a uh, a pixel value something that's an absolute value that will um be more specific for Outlook because it might not understand that. Maybe that'll help us out. Uh, so we did have the 1.8. I'm back in the browser mode to see if I can get this pretty close here. Um, I'm going to say something like 28 pixels. Um, that's pretty good. Maybe like 32 or something like that. Some pretty generous line height. Um, so I'm going to save that and then go back to my email previews. Wait for those to run. Uh, give it a minute here. I'm am live streaming, so these images might take a minute to populate, uh, but Limus is usually pretty damn fast, um, which is awesome. Go back to 2016, and it actually looks like that that helped out. Um, so I guess that might be a lesson to us to not use relative units for things like line height and email, because some of the Outlook clients that are using Microsoft Word's rendering engine won't see those relative units as um, lid. Uh, kind of measurement for line height. So we want to stick to our actual pixel values. So that was an actually a really easy case of fixing the line height issue. Um, if that didn't work, then the last kind of thing I would check is looking at um, using Microsoft specific property or some VML to see if I could get that working. I know from past experience that Microsoft has some MSO properties. It'll be like MSO dash line height, or you can see here like MS text size adjust. We have kind of this default boilerplate set to 100%. Um, Microsoft has these different dash MS or MSO dash table, like whatever those properties are that are specific to their email client. Um, so that might be kind of my last resort. If I can't get something working with regular HTML and CSS, then I would look towards Microsoft's proprietary stuff to see if I can get that working. But in this case, just switching the line height from relative units to absolute units seems to do the trick. We get our vertical spacing back, which is awesome. Um, so that's one thing I can cross off my list here. I had Outlook padding. Um, so the next one is gonna be the Outlook fonts. Uh, so even though our line is working good, uh, working well, rather, <laughs> I try to use good English, um, we have the text defaulting to what appears to be Times New Roman. Um, so that's that's one of those things I absolutely want to fix. Um, and what I'm going to do is kind of the same process, just try a couple of different things out. Um, so my first hunch is that the tables, Microsoft Outlook, for whatever reason, Words Engine, it prefers tables to use Times New Roman or there's some sort of weird bug in there that doesn't allow it to inherit the set styles in our parent element, which in this case, that div. Um, we know the rest of this, the paragraph stuff, is inheriting from that parent element. Um, so we know that's not an issue for that stuff, but maybe with tables it is when it comes to Outlook. Um, so my first instinct is to either set those styles directly on the secondary container where we were setting our background color, or I think we might be more useful if we set it at the table or table cell level um, for these different elements. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just test this out with this font family. Uh, it's set to sans serif. Um, take that and just try it in these different inline styles here. Um, so we'll start at the table level first. We'll add an inline style. Uh, set the font family to sans serif and just see if that happens to fix it for us. So it does, which is awesome. Uh, so I guess that's going to be a, a quick, easy fix for us and something we can kind of remember to build in um, later on here. So if you're using tables for your layout, if you're using tables for tabular data inside of your email, um, then you might want to apply some of these kind of styles, these default text styles, to that table element itself. As if you're wrapping it in a div, 
uh, then it isn't going to boil down to or kind of bubble down to those tables and those table cells. Um, so with that being known, my hunch is that we have this other div here um, wrapping the table, and that's where we're setting our background color. You know, if we look at this back in Outlook 2016 on Mac, we have a background color. We have this horizontal rule, that kind of stuff, uh, making our table look nice and styled and on brand. But we don't get that in in Microsoft Word's rendering engine for Outlook 2016. So my hunch is that knowing that uh, these styles should probably be applied to the table itself instead, and that's really a simple enough thing to do. We can take all of these inline styles. Um, I'll leave that div here for now for just a minute here. Hopefully it won't affect anything. Go back into our inline style attribute on the table itself and add those back in and see if that works. Um, so I did see that, uh, well, I guess Gareth was mentioning when I talked about the spacing between these different elements, he uses padding rather than margin. Uh, because it tends to be a little bit more cross-client compatible. And I totally agree with you. I think that's a great point. I am using margin here, um, but that's largely just because of me using these semantic elements. I feel like margin is... So when you're using something like a paragraph level element, um, which means by default it will take up like an entire block of the page, uh, this that whole horizontal section, um, and by default, a lot of web browsers and rendering engines will add spacing to that paragraph element or things like heading elements. Um, so I'm basically just setting margin there to override their styling with my styling, which is why I kind of use that for paragraphs and headings and how something like this is, is set up. Um, but totally valid that that padding is tends to be a little bit more well supported. If we go back to kind of email, uh, we can type in margin. Margin has about 60% support, um, and not, not that great, not that bad, depending on your email clients. But if we go to padding, padding has 85% support across email clients that are being tracked. Um, so that might be an instance where you do want to use padding on some of these elements uh, and maybe override margin as well to get rid of those default styles that browsers and email clients will apply. Um, but padding is really, really useful when you start using tables for your layouts. Um, so that's where you see, like, we're using tables for this layout and for this data because it makes sense. Uh, we're using padding on that table cell to add a little bit of vertical padding uh, between those lines of care. Uh, padding is... Sorry, I had another little hiccup there. Uh, I might need to look into some <laughs> different streaming software to get this a little bit more reliable. Um, but I was saying, uh, asking about the pros and cons of using divs instead of full tables in an email. Um, and when did I switch to using divs in your email code? So again, this is just kind of a stylistic thing. Most, most email templates and email code you'll come across in the wild will use tables for all of their layouts. Um, so if you're using, you know, two columns in an email, you'll have, uh, two table cells or... Like the, this would be a column, this would be a column. Um, use that for your layout, which is just kind of a, a side of the poor state of rendering across email clients. Um, so my kind of rule that I personally follow is to essentially use divs when you're using, if you're doing like a simple single column layout like this, you can get away with using divs for the most part. Um, and then just having these ghost tables for Microsoft, because uh, Microsoft's really the main culprit why we use tables in email to begin with. Um, but simpler layouts like this, single column layouts, you can usually use just div-based stuff uh, pretty reliably, um, just doing a couple of the fixes that we're looking at today. If you're getting into more complex layouts with like multiple columns, product grids, uh, different like article layouts or calendar layouts, things like that, uh, it can oftentimes be a little bit more understandable to use table-based layouts because you can set that stuff more precisely. Um, but I would say that there there are ways to do it without tables too. You, hybrid coding is one of the approaches that is really popular. Um, there's a bunch of different things. So 
that that's kind of my gut like rule is simple layouts i just rely on divs for the most part um, because it's a little bit easier but more semantically correct and feels more like you're being a good citizen of the web and the internet by using uh, proper markup um but if things get a little bit more complex or especially if you're updating legacy email templates that have been passed on through through the generations in email marketing you know then you might need to get really familiar using tables um but yeah there's so uh, getting back to our code here in troubleshooting uh when we apply the background color we got that for our table uh we're still seeing some issues with padding here on that table we're not going to get the border radius uh through css because it's an outlook and microsoft word doesn't support that um but if we were to look at our other email clients again we're we're still getting like what we need but since we took the padding off that div here we're not getting it in these email clients so that's something we're going to want to fix um the good news is that since we're now targeting that table element that container for all that data uh, we can simplify our code a little bit by getting rid of that wrapper div um, I'm going to adjust my indents here just so everything looks nice and clean. Um, but I, I know now that like looking at this, what we're missing is the padding around inside of this entire table and then the padding around the table cells, which we have right now because we're using padding on the table cells to give us that vertical spacing between those table cells. Uh, but we don't have padding on the overall table itself to make it a little bit more comfortable at that kind of white space, or I guess in this case, that gray space in the table itself. Um, so what I think I want to do is target the... I'm going to try by seeing what happens when I add cell padding to this table. Uh, so by default, for the most part, you're going to want to like cancel out the cell spacing and cell padding for each of your tables because it's not as controllable across all four dimensions, like the top, left, right, and bottom. Um, but if I add in, let's say, 10 pixels to that spacing, my hunch is that that will give us a whole bunch of spacing around all those table cells. Um, I guess padding inside, but it doesn't look like it's working, so I know that's not going to help us out. Um, I can look at my code here and I can see that I do have vertical padding on each of those table cells. So I think the next step would probably be to just add in some horizontal padding as well for each of those table cells. So we can test that out in, let's say our, our table header here, uh, which is this order number equals this made up number for our order. Um, so we have the vertical padding, which appears to be working. It's just that 10 pixels. Um, let's say we're gonna add 20 pixels on either side for that and see if we get a little bit of breathing room on the left side here. So awesome, that does work. So I think knowing that, testing it on that one element, that tells me that that thread I wanna pull on uh, for fix padding across the rest of this. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm just gonna replicate what I did here to add padding to all these other table cells too. Um, so I'm literally just going to copy this 20 pixels to keep things consistent um, and add that to each of my table cells here. Um, so anywhere, essentially anywhere I see zero or I'm filling out the kind of shorthand in these other ones so that the left and right get padding as well. I'm going to add that padding in. And then I'll simply save it and see how it's looking. Uh, we might need to adjust the values a little bit uh, just so it feels more like our original mockup and our original email. Um, but that's a good starting point. We know the padding's working both vertically and horizontally when it's applied to the table cells. Um, so that's what we're going to use to fix this. And when we fix this in Outlook, then it will naturally kind of flow down to all the other email clients because that works across all those other ones. Outlook's essentially like your lowest denominator. If you get things working there, then it'll work pretty well across all these other email clients. Um, so that's looking better. I, I do want to add a little bit more kind of vertical space at the start and end of each of, uh, of this table. So like the very first thing and the very last thing 
Um, but I actually want to see if I can do that at the table row level. Um, well, I guess I'll do that. And there's not a, a table header doesn't really have a, a row involved in it. So I'll say something like 40 pixels on top. Um, and I don't want that much on the bottom though. So let's do 20 pixels, 20 pixels around our shorthand there. Um, but I do want to see if it works on this table row. I'm just curious. I haven't styled the table row in a hot minute, um, but we'll say padding is equal to zero pixels on top, zero pixels, oops. Um, yeah, I don't want to do any pixels on the right or left, but then 40 pixels on the bottom um, and see what that looks like. Cool, so that works on top, but it doesn't look like table rows are taking in inline styles, which I actually think might be the proper usage of them. I don't think you're supposed to apply anything there if we're following our HTML and CSS rules properly. Um, so I'll just target this, this stuff down here. So I can take these last two table cells, which is the total and then that monetary value, and add in 40 pixels on the bottom so that it matches the top up here. So. We'll say this is you know the first in your shorthand property for padding, the margin stuff. The first value is your top, and then you have your right. So then we want bottom is 40 pixels, and then on our left, we're gonna say 20 pixels as well, um, just so that it's even. And then we're gonna copy that and paste a below there. And boom, it looks like it's working pretty well. Uh, one other issue that I, I notice here is that we're, we're applying this border, uh, which you can see in our other, like our default version, we have this blue border kind of separating the itemized order versus the total and tax and subtotal. Um, we're applying that at the table row level. So we saw that that's not working in Outlook. Um, so I think it might be time to figure out a better solution for that. Um, so my first instinct is that we could add this to the, essentially the table cells themselves, um, and maybe just make it table or border top instead. And my kind of hunch though, is that we might have a weird little gap issue, um, between the table cells themselves. Um, but let's see what that actually looks like. Oh, so that actually works, but I, it looks like I kind of put it in the wrong place. I do, in fact, want border bottom. Um, oops. Cool, so we got that, that seems to be working well. Uh, another option, which I actually might go with, is to essentially add in another table row that is a container for our line. Um, and this is kind of cool because it gives us a little bit more flexibility um, with that, that border. Um, so I'm gonna copy the color value just so I have that blue. I'm actually gonna get rid of this border bottom on these table cells. Um, back to our kind of default state here. And then what I'm gonna do is add in another table row that will contain that uh, border. Um, so I'll add in a table, stock, table cell here. Um, and then really what I'm gonna be doing is styling the table cell itself. Um, and not really have content necessarily inside of that table. So um, I will add in a, what's called breaking space, which is just kind of like a little piece of like dummy filler code there to make sure that there's something in there to, to apply like styles or like there's something filling up that space. Um, but then I'm gonna add in some CSS to style the table cell itself. So I'm gonna say the background color is that value we had. Um, save it and see what that looks like. We're probably gonna need to add in some padding or some height uh, to these table cells because it might be a little bit big. Yep, um, so the, 
that's not going to work there, but we are going to say I add in a cal span equals two, similar to how we have this table header cal span two. Uh, so it takes up that whole area. Um, I'm going to make the height of this, let's say two pixels, um, to shrink that down so it's not just this massive block instead of the line we want. And we'll see if that works. Um, so the 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 width works using cal span, but that height doesn't seem to be working. Um, so I wonder if we set that instead in our inline style to you know, two pixels, um, or we might need to uh, kind of adjust this non-breaking space or play around with the font size of the non-breaking space or something like that. Um, so that doesn't be, seem to be working there. I wonder if Mark has something we can use from goodemailcode.com. Um, oh, so he has something, a horizontal rule here. Uh, which might be exactly what we need because that's exactly what that is, is a horizontal rule separate content. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and copy this code out and put it into mine and see what happens here. Um, so I'm actually going to take out this style there, add in the horizontal rule and see what that looks like. And that might actually be a really good solution because then we can adjust the padding of it so that it's not bumping up against the the content there. So that's not too bad. Um, the background I'm going to, uh, whoops, grab that blue color. Um, I have one up here. Uh, where'd my horizontal rule go? There we go. Um, the height, 1M, is going to be equal to what the kind of like default font size is, which in our case is 18 pixels, I believe is what we set it to. So I'm actually going to say change the height of the horizontal rule to, um, let's say, 2 pixels and see if that kind of fixes this. Um, close that out. So that's looking a lot better, but we still have a lot of space in here. Um, so I want to see if I can control that via the inline styles uh, on the table cell itself, similar to how we do with the rest of the, the padding on those elements. So I'm just gonna set the padding to zero and see what that looks like. So that's looking better. Uh, it's right up against everything though. So I'm gonna add a little bit of padding to kind of coincide with what we have across the other ones. So on the top and bottom, I'm gonna say zero pixels because there's already that spacing between those other elements. And then just add 20 pixels on the left and right of that element there. Wait for our preview to reload and see how it's working. And boom, it, it looks like things are working pretty well. So if we go across to our other email clients, it's looking as we intend, which is awesome. Um, so I'm pretty comfortable with that in Outlook. Um, it looks like the color is not displaying as well as I would like. So it looks like it's still defaulting to black. Um, but that's one of those things that I don't really care about that much. It doesn't change the... Like it's not as obvious that obvious to change the overall like branding feel of our email and it's not like a functional thing that we need to worry about it's still clearly delineating those bits of content so i'm not that worried about it um so i'm pretty happy with looking in our outlook clients um functionally everything's good the layout the structure is all good again we aren't getting rounded corners but i'm not worried about that things don't need to be pixel perfect across email clients um, but the last thing I kind of have on my list in the last couple of minutes here are on mobile email clients, you can see that it's this text is just kind of big for that table. Um, so it's kind of hard to read that. Everything just sort of bunches up against each other. Um, my pro's not that bad, but the easiest way to do this to kind of optimize your content for mobile is to target the individual elements that you want to update. 
and then override them in the head of your email using media queries. So you can see we have this media query up top here that says at media screen. So anytime this is shown on a screen, which is the only place an email should be shown, unless you're printing things out, which is still kind of weird. Uh, and saying max width 600 pixels. So anytime this email is shown on 600 pixel or smaller device or screen, then it's going to apply some CSS in here. Um, so I'm just going to add in a class here, say, uh, let's call it like mobile text um, and set the font size to, let's say, like, uh, let's say 16 pixels. I don't want to go too small here. Um, and say important since we're overriding inline styles, um, you're going to need to use that important declaration to make sure that this is precedent over any other styles applied to that element. Um, and then I'm going to just take that and apply, add that class anything that I want to affect. Uh, so I'm going to try to see if it works at the overall table level um, instead of applying that to each of the table cells, since that's where we're setting the overall like font size on things. Um, so let's see if, uh, what was my class there, mobile text. If that makes this text a little bit smaller here. So it does. We, we know that's working. We might need to make that even smaller on like Gmail if we want to or adjust the, the padding on our table cells if we need to. Um, but I'm actually pretty happy with that. I, I think I might apply that to the disclaimer as well um, since that's a little bit... A little bit big for my taste. Um, so again, we can say class equals mobile text. Save it. And it should be a little bit smaller. And that's, that's essentially, that's what I would call a utility class when we're coding. Um, so it's a class that does like one specific thing uh, that you can utilize across your code to adjust different aspects of your brain. Um, if I wanted to make a secondary, like that disclaimer text, even smaller or left aligned instead of center aligned or a different color or line height, um, I could very easily add in like a dot mobile text small or something like that. Whatever you want to call your class, write those rules there and then just apply it to any element that I need to, to work in. Um, and the nice thing is that that's inside of that media query, so that'll only affect our mobile clients as opposed to all of our email clients. Um, so I'm actually pretty happy with how this, this email is turning out at this point. Uh, we fixed what we set out to fix inside of Outlook that we can kind of easily do. Uh, we could always take things farther with VML, but I'm not that worried about it. Um, so we have a nice looking receipt email that we built last month. Uh, we trouble shot some troubleshooted troubleshot. I'm not sure what's the correct term there, uh, but made this work across all those different email clients. We did a little bit of lightweight mobile optimization. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it there for today. We're at the top of the hour here. Um, I'm getting thirsty and hungry uh, since it's a little bit after lunchtime for me. Um, but I did want to thank everybody for hopping on here. Uh, let me know that you could actually hear me during the live stream. And invite everybody to obviously subscribe to the uh, Litmus YouTube channel. i um, just going to switch back over so you can see me here. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel for Litmus. We're doing this again every single month, the second Friday of the month. This month was a little bit late because we had a competing webinar with marketing profs. Uh, but live coding sessions are going to be second February or second Friday in, fe in each month. Uh, this is February. And then the last Friday of every month is going to be live optimization, which we did last month was really, really fun. Um, it's going to be even better because we're going to start bringing in different email geeks and friends and guests to help us optimize all those email campaigns live. Uh, so this is going to, that's going to be next Friday, I believe is the last Friday in the month. Um, might be two weeks. I don't even know what the day is at this point. It's time is a construct that doesn't make sense to me anymore. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be doing this monthly. Subscribe on YouTube. You'll get updates. Uh, subscribe to the Litmus newsletters at litmus.com. Subscribe. Uh, we'll be notifying everybody that way too. Um, we're at Litmus app on Twitter. Uh, we always post a bunch of stuff there. Reminders about webinars, live streams, uh, all kinds of articles and resources we publish there. Uh, but yeah, thank you everybody. I'm, I'm glad it looks like everybody uh, had a fun time and hopefully got a couple of tips on troubleshooting their own email campaigns. 
And I think next we'll probably, if they continue on with this email, uh, we'll look at how to make a really good, solid, dark mode version of this email campaign. Um, something we've seen over the past you know, two years or so is that dark mode usage is on the rise. People love dark mode, uh, so we should probably adapt our emails to work well or as well as they can inside of dark mode. Uh, so there's definitely a couple of coding tricks we'll go over, some actual design elements and design tricks that we can do with things like our images and logos. Um, so feel free to join me again on Friday of March, and we will go in and optimize this email for dark mode versions. Um, so thanks, everybody. Uh, I, I appreciate it. This recording will be up on the YouTube page uh, as soon as I click close here and then stream. Uh, so you can check it out later if you need to. And I'm looking forward to next time, next month, when we start making a dark mode email. So have a great rest of the day and have an awesome weekend. And I will see you next time on the Limits YouTube channel. Cheers.